Happy 15 years, church. Woo! Awesome, awesome. I can't believe it. The years are flying by. I raise my bottle of water to you. Here's to another 15 years, dilly dilly. Another 15 years. It is, it is exciting what God has done. And today we're going to look backwards. We're going to look to today, and we're going to look to the future. And it is, it is just a momentous day, a day of, of time to celebrate all that God has done. Who was here in the very beginning when we were at this place right here? Anybody remember this one? In the basement, yes, of Cary Christian School. Before they moved, this is when they were underground. We shared the library. That first day, it was icy. Ryan was talking about it. It's like, man, what happened? It's 80 degrees today. It's awesome. Are you complaining? Are you? I like it, but, you know, I'm about to sweat. This is one of those days that you appreciate. This was 77 people showed up on this day, and we outgrew this so quickly, we moved to the next place, which I affectionately know as the dungeon. This was East Cary Middle School, I believe, before they did the renovations. And notice the incredibly comfortable green disc chairs that you could sit on with no back. That was awesome. And the tables, if they weren't locked down, would slowly come together and form a teepee. <laughs> While you had your coffee and your Bibles on it, things were happening. And it was fun, man. Potter's hand, you never know what's coming next. From there, we outgrew that, and we went to this place, Reedy Creek Elementary. And this was a big step up, literally, because we actually finally had a platform. And we had our banner, and some of us had hair. And if you look behind that banner, I think we have a picture of whose height. There she is. Oh, the ageless wonder. Still playing keyboard, still doing it. And this was the last time we were at this place. From there, God gave us our semi-permanent location where we are today. And if you notice, even the date in the bottom right-hand corner, I'll get out of the way, October 24, 2004. Ah, oh, yes, yeah, some of the musicians have moved on. Some of the hair has moved on. <laughs> the screen, you don't have to say most of it, it's okay. The screen has doubled. We've, we've, we've done some incredible renovations, which has brought us to where we are today. And it is awesome. What God has done is nothing short of miraculous. And I praise God for you, for your faithfulness, for your generosity. These are special days. In fact, one of the surprises I was working on for today was I secretly spoke with our pastor emeritus. And I said, you got to come back. Please come back and preach one, one more time on this, this great day. And he was so quick to accept it. I would love to. I'm coming back. And then an unforeseen circumstance happened. And uh, I'm going to let him tell you about it. He, he, he sent a, a short letter this week. So I'm going to read. And you just sit back and enjoy a brief word from our pastor emeritus. The man, the legend himself, Dr. Rumley, sends you his greetings. And he says this, Dear Potter's Hand, family and friends, I celebrate today with you as one who truly knows what celebration of God's people is all about. As I think back on our time together as your pastor, I am thrilled at what God has done and is still doing with his people at PH. God has taken a little, and he has done so much. He has truly blessed our church family in ways just not seemingly possible. Life for me has changed. I find myself reflecting back at PH with so much thanksgiving in my heart for you. My health has changed. I've gotten just a tad bit older, but hopefully a little wiser too. I'd planned on being with you today to celebrate this, but I got a call to go to the MUSC hospital in Charleston to see if I can hopefully qualify for a kidney transplant. Will you please pray for us? I am on dialysis and I'm doing well. I hook up every day on peritonea something dialysis every night. You got it? That's it. <laughs> Every night, I do this for 10 and a half hours, and I am so thankful for a great helper and friend in my wife, Diane. She has served by my side for 12 of the 13 years of ministry at PH. She truly helps it be a team effort. And like I said, my physical body is getting older, but my commitment to Christ is stronger than ever. Diane and I attend Lakeside Baptist Church, where I teach a small group class, and I get the opportunity to preach every now and then. I can remember so vividly God speaking to myself, to Lynn, to Pastor Matt, and to Amy about starting this new church. We were at, where else? The beach. And God's Holy Spirit spoke to us, as he only can at the beach like this. And he went before us and began to plant this dream in our hearts and our minds. As we came back to Cary, our very first Sunday, the very next Sunday, we met in a basement of a Christian school. You just saw the photo of it. On that first Sunday, 
we had 77 excited worshipers find us and show up. I look back at those days, and I'm so grateful for a number of things. One, the number of people who have given their hearts and lives to Christ. Number two, the way in which God brought two families, the Rumleys and the Mitchells, together to lead his people. No church has ever had two families who loved Christ, loved each other, and loved the people more than we have. Oh, thank you. I stand in awe of the way God worked it out for me to retire like this and for Dr. Mitchell to begin his service as lead pastor. I want to thank you, church. Thank you for being supporting. Thank you for being loving. You were there for me, for my family, when we needed you the most. When Lynn died so unexpectedly, you were there for us. You are an awesome family. Diane and I thank you, off, uh, thank you, and we think of you often. We pray for you regularly. And lastly, I want to publicly thank God for being such a friend to me and to my family. Diane and I, we thank God for you. What a privilege to serve as your pastor for 13 years. So many tremendous works of God seen in those years. And as you celebrate today, let the praises of Jesus rise from your hearts and your lips. With love, Dr. and Mrs. Steve Rumley, Pastor Emeritus. God bless you, Pastor. I'm thinking about you. Amen. And that brings us to today, where God has continued to grow, and we have the greatest staff on the planet, a team that I am so excited to work with each and every week. And we have seen hundreds of lives changed. We've seen people saved. We've seen people be baptized. We've seen people come and dedicate their children and marriages be established and broken homes restored, disciples made, missionaries supported, missionaries sent around the country, around the world, community unity happening like never before in joint worship services, and on and on and on. God has done incredible things in our midst, and I believe even greater things lie ahead for us. In fact, being completely candid, I am more excited today than I was the day we started this church. I am more excited for the next 15 years of what is coming. This is going to be an incredible next season for us. When we look here and we think of the potter's hand, I hope you feel that it is a safe place, a place where you can come and understand why we do what we do, a place where you can let down your guard, you can let your hair down, you can take off your masks, you don't have to play dress up. It's a place where we can come and hear God's word and know that our mission is to love him and then love people, and thereby go serve him and serve people. Here at the potter's hand, our goal is to be a little different and to, to, to go and embrace simplicity. And in a world that doesn't do that, everything's going the other direction. Everything's going towards more and more, more complexity, more razzmatazz and jazz hands. You know, I love my jazz hands. And, and I look around and I see these things that are just going with more craziness. And, and I think, no, can't we just have an enjoyable place where God's word is central, where we revere it, where we esteem it, where worship is the highest honor, where we don't get caught up in the latest fads and trends and fog machines and laser lights and fire-breathing pyrotechnics and hula hoops hanging from the ceiling with Cirque du Soleil dancers and all the stuff where all these places seem to be just going more and more crazy. And I feel like I've stepped into Las Vegas. We don't have to do that. We don't have to compete with that. We can offer the life-changing gospel. Nashville can't do that. Hollywood can't do that. Vegas can't do that. We can offer the genuine article. We can give them something they're looking for. And, and the real deal is what people are hungry for, the genuine, authentic, unashamed focus on the Bible and believers who come who are like-minded, who don't apologize for holding to God's truth, where we don't judge people, but the power of God's Word does all the judging we need. And our job is to hold it up and to revere it and to let God speak through it. That is why we do what we do here and why we don't do that which we don't do. So as we celebrate 15 years, I thought it's important that we take a step back, we look back, we celebrate it, and we honor it because it is awesome. And Anything we have done great, God gets the credit for. And I get to stand on the shoulders of giants like Pastor Steve, Billy Graham, People like that who have gone and done incredible things. But I want to know why we do what we do. And that's where it gets really fun. I want to set the context for what we're about to read. But go ahead and open your Bibles to Matthew 22. 
Hold your place there or pull up your favorite Bible app. Matthew 22, let me welcome our online campus this week. Great to have you with us. If you can't be here live, it is the next best thing. Matthew 22, and just kind of hold your place because it is so important anytime someone is preaching that they set the context of what you're about to read. Never take a verse out of context. That's isogesis. That's where you read into it what you think it says, what you want it to say. We want to do the exegesis here and look at what God has to say. The context of this, to me, I'm just going to be frank with you, is hilarious. I can't help it, and you're going to see in just a minute how hilarious this is to me. There are two rival gangs who are trying to trap Jesus. They're coming up, and one of them is known as the rival gang of the Pharisees, and the other one is the Sadducees, okay? Pharisees, keepers of the law, very, very pious. The Sadducees were a group of people they didn't believe in the resurrection. That's why they were sad, you see? Oh, come on, that joke never gets old. That's, that's, that's it. That's the best I got for, for Sadducees. You try to make something out of that. The Sadducees and the Pharisees don't like each other. They pretend to get along, but make no mistake, they're rivals. But they don't like this new Nazarene even more. He is a threat to them. And they don't like it. In fact, they're coming up to him, and they're trying to trap him. You'll see in verse 15 that they're coming up to him, and they're being so slimy about it. It makes me just kind of want to, ugh. The Pharisees come up, and they blatantly say, oh, let's, let's butter him up. Teacher, we know that you are good, and you, you are righteous, and you do not care what anyone thinks, apparently. Like, that's a jab, you know, like, oh, 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 this little uneducated Nazarene. We're the law experts, and we come up, and we have a question for you. Jesus, so full of grace, just very gently spanks them. It is so beautiful. <laughs> he comes up, and the Pharisee, the leader, comes up and says, uh, tell us, uh, is it lawful for us to pay taxes to Caesar? Jesus, without missing a beat, says, show me a coin. Oh, happy to give him a coin. They give him a coin. He holds it up and says, whose face is on this? I said, well, that's Caesar, of course. Okay, well, give to Caesar that which is Caesar's and give to God the things that are God's. Bing. And you could just hear a pin drop. The Pharisees are like, wait, what? what? What just happened? How did it? I think I just got spanked, and I don't understand what happened, and I'm supposed to be the expert. It doesn't end there. The Pharisees slink away. The Sadducees come up. I love the Sadducees. They're, they're, oh, they're awesome. They come up, and I just can't help this. Every time these two show up in Scripture, I get this mental picture. This goes back to my, it must be my musical day. I think of a bad off-Broadway version of West Side Story, where you've got these two rival gangs. you got the Pharisees over here with the basketball, and you got the Sadducees. And they're always just, just, just ready to do it. You want to rumble? You want to go? And you always feel like, they're so close, yet they're so far apart, and they, they threaten each other, and the Sadducees don't like the Pharisees. It's like, you, you want to go? Let's meet. We're going to meet under the stadium, and we're going to settle. We're going to have a rumble. We're going to have this type thing, right? So you got the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and they're duking it out, but they never seem to lay a finger on Jesus. All their entrapments, all their, let's butter them up, and let's just see if we can get them in a trick question, and we'll try to ensnare them and make them look foolish. And they never can seem to lay a glove and they never really lay a glove on each other. And for some reason, inexplicably, it always seems to end off in a dance-off where they just have this, this crazy thing. And I just, this is the mental picture I get when the Pharisees, the Sadducees come on the scene, okay? That's how weird your pastor is. When, when I see this, I immediately think, these guys are in middle school. They're coming up, and the Sadducees prove it. They come up in the very next question, okay? I'm setting the stage for how Jesus is about to read this next part, okay? The Sadducees come up, and they have the most laughable question for him. And they think it's smart. They come up and say, oh, teacher, suppose a brother who has seven other brothers dies and his wife is left without children. And the second brother, let's say he marries her. And this is how the Sadducees talk. They talk like this. And, and he marries her, but he dies, doesn't have children. And then another one marries her. And third and fourth, fifth, all, all seven of them marry her. And then they all die in heaven. Whose wife will she be? Because we don't know. And I love it. It's a, what a ludicrous question. Jesus' response is awesome. He looks at him. I can just hear he's got love, but he's just, he's, you're trying to trick the, the wisdom of the ages? Seriously? He looks at him and he says, no, <laughs> you're wrong because you don't know the scriptures. You're whitewashed tombs. Oh, outside you look so great, man. You got it going on but you're not fooling me. I love it. His first answer, whose who's will she be? She's, you know, I, I don't understand. Who, will, will she be? They all married her. And he says, no, you're wrong. 
You don't know the scriptures. Church, there's a lesson there for us. Lest we be like the Sadducees. This is so powerful. He comes up and he says this, okay? Now the crowds are hearing this and they're gathering around. You just know they're all looking like, he just, he just got the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they're popping popcorn. They're like, they just want to watch. I'm just here to, to read the comments. And they're looking at it and they're they, I can't believe this. What's going to happen? And that sets the stage. They're astonished. Read with me what happens next. Verse 34 says, when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, and you know they're happy about that. They're high-fiving each other. You know they are. They came together, and one of them, an expert in the law, goes back and asks him a question to test him. Look, that reveals his motive. It's to test him. Notice it's not for knowledge. Teacher, which command in the law is the greatest? And he said to him, love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the greatest and most important command. Oh, and the second one, by the way, is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law, all the prophet, everything hangs on these two commandments. And church, <laughs> there it is. The why we do what we do. If I had to pick one passage for this momentous day, this is it. This is why it's emblazoned on the walls in giant foot-tall letters as soon as you come in the door. Love God, love people. This is so powerful. Jesus, in just a few short sentences, silences his critics, but he does far more than that. He boils down God with everything in your being. In fact, your love should be, wait for it, all-consuming. How you doing with that? Your love should be a raging fire. Say, God, I will fall into place. I will seek first you and your righteousness. And all these other, we just sang this. And we just sang the great commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, your strength. This is incredible. Jesus is saying this is supposed to be your driving force. Day in, day out. When you wake up, your feet hit the ground. You say, Lord, I am all in. So as your pastor, let me friendly, gently ask, how you doing with that? What a lofty goal. What an appropriate goal in our 15 years. This is incredible. But notice, he doesn't stop there. He turns his attention upward, and he goes outward, and he says, next, you got to love people. Ooh, this is easier said than done. Every one of you has somebody flash through your mind right now that's difficult to love. Everyone, I hope it's not me. <laughs> if it is, I apologize. Love God, then love people. This is no accident, church. He seamlessly, notice this, he seamlessly transitions right into that. He doesn't even take a breath. Here's the most important thing, and by the way, there's another one just like it. Bing! And he zings them, and he says, how you doing with that? Do you love people? He's saying, guys, listen up. Here's a secret. You love God? You say you love the Father? Awesome. Guess what? That is supposed to translate into love for your neighbor. And half the people in that crowd probably gulped really big. What do you mean, love my neighbor? He's unclean. He doesn't look like me. He doesn't make what I make. He doesn't live where I live. His skin color looks different. He, what do you mean, love everybody? That's just a platitude, right? No. Jesus sits there and he says, your love for God will naturally lead to love for people, those who are made in his image. You love the image maker? then you need to love the image bearers. This was radical. This was, man, the Pharisees, what is he saying? Their heads are exploding. Sadducees just give up. Man, they just go home. They're still sad. <laughs> this is incredible. This is, this is so, these things are interconnected, and Jesus didn't waste a breath. He said, boom, boom, these two, back to back. They are interconnected. To quote the great theologian, Master Kenobi, what happens to one affects the other. It is a symbiotic circle. Surely you understand this. Even a Jedi fictional character gets it. Think about this. And by the way, while we're talking about this, if you see this meme going around on social media, please know you are not sharing a picture of Jesus when you do this. That's Obi-Wan Kenobi. That's a British, I'm pretty sure Jesus wasn't a green-eyed Anglo-Saxon with a British accent. Okay? When we share things like this, we may mean well, but we end up looking foolish for ourselves. Okay? So just wanted to mention that while we're talking about the wisdom of Obi-Wan. Jesus sums it all up, and he says, your love upward 
and your love outward. Love God and love people. How are we doing with that? Because that's the goal. This is so powerful. In just a few short sentences, he summarizes all the law, the whole Old Testament, and then writes the New Testament, boiling down the wisdom of the ages to its essence. Love for God means love for your neighbor. So it's important on this day to know why we do what we do. Every few months, I like to give a vision update, to not only look backwards and to look where we are to look around, but to look forward. And some of you, you may not have been here, and it's been 16 months since we launched a brand new campaign that was The Vision, Embrace the Vision campaign. And it has gone fantastically well, and I can't wait to share all these details with you today. I want to bring everyone up to speed. If you've just joined us, and many people have in the last year and a half, two, three, four years, we have been in this building 13 and a half years as of this month. 13 and a half years, and it has been a huge blessing. Make no mistake about it, if you were here when we did the teardown and the setup and the teardown and the setup, and if you can find us this week, you get to worship with us. That was kind of our unofficial motto when it was hot, when it was cold, hoping the equipment would work, hoping volunteers would show up, they weren't getting burned out. And then God finally provided this, and it was fantastic. 12,000 square feet. The only problem was it was empty. We didn't have any of this. Everything was exposed like this. It was just a dry concrete slab. No air, no heat, no plumbing, no pipes, nothing, no lights. Just open the windows and hope you see. So we came and we met. And the leadership of the team met with the landlord at the time. And we said, we got to upfit this. Is there any way you can help us out? Because we had nothing. I'll tell you what we'll do. We will upfront fund you this cost. To upfit these 12,000 square feet was $537,000. Okay, a little over half a million. Well worth it, no problem. Things are expensive, I get it. Houses sometimes cost that. I don't know what people do for a living that can buy that, but that's awesome, good for them. You ever wonder that? And I, so, sorry, is that just me? I drive by and I'm like, houses from the 850s. Like, from the 850s? What? You're starting there? What is that? So this was a half a million. And each year that we stayed here, a little bit more of our payment would go to paying off that debt. A little bit more will be considered paid off and forgiven. So as of the last couple years, we sit here today completely, totally, 100% debt-free. That is awesome. Yeah, you can give God the glory for that. That is fantastic. We give God the credit for it. That debt is paid off because of your faithfulness, because of God moving in your heart, your generosity. You made that happen. Many, if not most of you, have committed above and beyond your tithes and offerings to help this vision. You have done incredible things. All the arrows are pointing in the right direction. I mean, from some lean days four or five years ago. Some of you remember those days where we're, we're not even sure if we could pay the light bill or the rent. All that to where 2015 was better than 2014. 2016 came along and blew 2015 away. 20, this year we just finished was by far the best year we've ever, by any metric, and we give God the credit. In fact, you guys have done so much above and beyond the normal. And I want to thank you. And I want to give you the credit and give God all the honor for this. Not counting assets like gold and silver that you've given and, and jewelry and stocks and estate donations. Some of you are talking about your wills and wanting to leave an eternal inheritance. And somebody said, not counting any of that, just your $50 and your $100 donations for 16 months. For the first time ever this week, we cross $50,000 that you have done. That's awesome. That is incredible. Remember, this is, this, is above, this is cash on hand in the vision fund. To go from shortly, not long ago, being able to even wonder if you're going to pay rent, baby, can we make mac and cheese one more night because I got to tie my whole check back to the church, that kind of Sunday, to that is huge, church. That is awesome. That's miraculous. That's what Pastor Steve's talking about when he's talking about these things that God is doing, taking a little and doing much. This is great. So if you are not a part of the vision campaign, would you pray about it? If you haven't given to that, maybe you want to pray, but that's it. No, no high-pressure sales pitch. That's my pitch. Pray about it and just be obedient. We need you. End of speech on that. From here... We look around and we say, God, what is the next step? This is where it gets really exciting and where something has changed. 
You see, as we look, we think, Lord, can we buy this? Is there something else? As of last week, we got to notice that in the meantime, no matter what he provides in the future, 5,000 additional square feet has just come available two doors down. Enabling us, on Tuesday, I get to walk through this and see it's already upfitted. There is no cost. It could be ready for a preschool. It could be ready for a school. It could be ready for a homeschool. It could be administrative where we turn the rest of this into move all the offices out. We, there's all kinds of things. A, a, a homeschooling network, a, a mom's morning out, you name it. There's a possibility that it's never been there before. Would you pray for that? In 48 hours, I do that walkthrough. And I want only what God wants. I want to see this. I want to walk through it. I want to pray there. I want to see, God, are you in that? But that's just the, uh, scratching the surface. Because we're looking at even more things. As I look around and I'm thinking, God, do you have something? Do you want us to expand where we are in the current campus? Do you want us to do something? I'm always looking for undeveloped land. I'm looking for even existing buildings. And some of you have been pointing them out to me, like this one right here. I love this. This is great. You all know this. It's sitting empty. 36,000 square feet, I believe. Triple what we have here. They could have a school. They could have a gymnasium. They could have all kinds of stuff. And the location's awesome because it's next to Carabas. It don't get better than that. Or CC's if it's a lean week for you. Like, I get it. Next to Carabas and CC's, you got something like that. They've already got it ready. Your church name here. Only problem is it's still leased for another few months, and it's empty, and they are in no hurry to get somebody out because they're just getting the money. It's coming in. Whoever had that before HH grade, they're still paying for that. But when that comes available, we'll pray about it. We'll see. That's a commute all of us can make. But we say, God, what else do you got? Is there something else you're bringing? We look for things that are already upfitted because it's a lot cheaper and a lot quicker and a lot simpler on us and a lot better use of our stewardship and our money, and that's what it's all about for us. Very few church campuses come open. There is one. It's this one right here, and it's gorgeous. It's fantastic. It sits on Highway 70 and has 50,000 cars a day containing a majority of lost people going by this, where it has its gymnasium. And it's great. And it's got a school, the whole basement. It's got five acres of pavement on each side so you can have your community events and you don't have to wonder, will I get slapped by somebody who doesn't like my sign being out? And there's all kinds of endless possibilities. There's just one catch. You got to have a down payment. And a down payment on this is 15 to 20 percent, which is around $400,000. We're on our way. We're doing great. If that door remains open by the time God provides that kind of down payment, then I will come back and we will look at pictures and we'll have a party and we'll all go walk through it and we can pray about it. It's about 12 miles away, about as far as Reedy Creek was when we started. It'd be a lot farther for me, but it'll be closer for some. I don't know if God's in that or not. I'm trying to show you how rare these things are, what we're doing, because I'm leading somewhere. Up until this moment, I have always felt a yellow light with doing certain things with the church. I've always said, yes, son, that is right when I pray, but the Lord feels like just don't, there's not a green light yet. That changed preparing this message. Rather than for us to just sit around and say, one day we're going to do this, one day we're going to dream big and we can do bold things for the Lord, God said, your one day is now. No more sitting on yellow. I have felt a release for us to proceed to do some of these things instead of waiting, always thinking, oh, he's got this great vision for the thing. God has given me a kingdom work for us to accomplish right here. Rather than wait and for us to say, hey, I wonder what we could do, God has said, love God, love people right where you are in your backyard, around the state, overseas. I want to recap a few things, and then I'm going to land on something that you haven't seen coming. One of the ways that we are going to increase our vision, is overseas. We have a team right here who is going overseas to Ghana, and it's coming up. And we have a chance to partner, to show love and support, and not just, hey, I might just be praying for you, but to do something in addition to that, to put action to it, to bless them. On March 25th, you're going to see on this wall several blessings that you can help with, that you can partner with. And it is going to be incredible. I'm talking real tangible ways that you can partner and not wait. You can't go for yourself, you can help somebody. In addition to money, in addition to praying, they will have cards up here on this wall where we can come up and you can pick. Some of these cards will have things like, can you donate clean underwear and tube socks? Because I'm talking with Pastor Bill, 
One of the things that we don't get as Americans, wearing clean underwear is a luxury over there. In fact, they save it, you ready for this? For special occasions. Let that sink in. They can use our help. Clean underwear for children. Tube socks. Simple things like that. Or a card that says, for $50, you can have 20 New Testaments printed and given into their hands. Or school supplies. Or a dozen backpacks. Or provide 200 snacks and a drink for them during vacation Bible school. On and on. Writing utensils. Things we take for granted that we don't even notice, we don't even think about bracelets that have the gospel printed on it, that they get 250 wristbands for a $50 card. Pray about your part in that. That's overseas, but we are touching people around the world. They need your help and your support. By the way, it's not just there. Check out our ministry wall. It's been totally redone this month. There are local needs that you can help with, and I encourage you, drop by and check it out. It's between the water fountains. If you haven't seen it, do it. There's exploring uh, local services and missions right here. Now, these are some that I thought we were going to have to wait. I'm going to be honest. I thought this was for a future date. I thought this was for some grand campus where we just throw rose petals around, and we were so excited, and God said, no more waiting. Y'all remember when I shared this vision in October of 2016? I said, I, I just want to meet people's real physical needs right where we live. I want to do that. I mean, like need people who don't even go to the dentist, people who don't even go, they're, they're so scared and so, so underfunded, they can't even get to a clinic. You all remember this photo? This is pretty powerful. The health screening ministry, the medical dental, and, and, and some of these things. Well, guess what? They're coming. We booked them. They are on their way. Okay, yeah. These guys... This is, this, is, this is incredible. They are booked so far in advance. They're booked months out. So we got on their calendar, and they are coming here to our parking lot right here. And they will be able to provide, with our help, obviously the dental cleanings and medical aid, but health screenings that people aren't getting. Some of the people around in our neighborhoods, right around here, people who have never had their vitals assessed. Simple things like blood pressure and BMI and screening for diabetes and A1C and glucose monitoring and high cholesterol, depression, heart disease, you name it. We will have a chance to meet real needs, to be the hands and feet of Jesus and actually show love without asking for a thing in return. Church, that's the heartbeat of Christ right there. To give to someone who can't pay you back. When they look at you with tears in your eyes and you just hug them and say, God loves you, and so do I. Obviously, we're going to need some help with this. Pastor, that sounds great. Where's the catch? <laughs> you know there's a catch. Those beautiful rigs that you see on the top, they don't come with all those smiling faces. That's where you come in. Yeah, they'll come with a few professionals, but we got to enlist some more professionals, dentists, hygienists. PAs, physician assistants, EMTs, all those things. But we need regular church folks by the truckload to be here, to register these people, to love on them, to help sign them in, to, to be on the welcome tent, to pray with people, to counsel people if they request it, to take blood pressure, to provide snacks for the children and child care while mom and dad are seeing a doctor who have never seen a doctor in their life and are probably having a lot of news shared to them in that quite frightening moment. And we have a chance to love their kids and take them around to our building and show them Jesus' love and feed them. You probably can't clean teeth, but can you give a cup of cold water in Jesus' name? Y'all, oh, that's real ministry. It's not talking about it. That's not even writing a check and saying, please, you go do it for me. That is hands and feet of Christ. And lastly, one of the mission opportunities we have is in our own backyard, literally. A year ago, we had some service days here, and it was phenomenal. Look around. I mean, it, when you see the old pictures and what it is, and it, the place has never looked better. And it's going on 14 years old. It has never looked better or more inviting or more conducive to focusing on worship. Now we have a chance to do the outside, specifically our children's ministry. So we've met in the last two weeks with the owner of this facility, and he has granted a miracle, permission for us to renovate something that is sorely lacking. Namely, our children's ministry playground. Look with me, if you will. Exhibit A. <laughs> You're already laughing? <laughs> All right. This, <laughs> this is going on 10 years old, almost everything in here. And it has held up remarkably well. It really has. 
But as you look closer, you start seeing a little bit of issues and some safety issues. And the closer you look, the sadder it looks. In fact, this is the first impression that many people will have of our church. Long before they even come in these doors, they try to find where we are. And if you're like me, you go find that place and you circle around it and you look. And this is their first impression. Where the tallest thing you can climb are weeds. We can do better than that. We have to do better than that. This is no intention of anybody. This, this is just natural wear and tear, and we have never, until this moment, had the money to even address this. This is where you come in. We're going to do something miraculous here. With your help and the Lord providing, we're going to turn this into this, the potter's hand playland, okay? Our landlord has approved this. Something similar to this will be built. I promise you don't want me building this. You don't want, and some of you may not. You think, oh, I can't help with that. Oh, contraire, mon frere. Because what has happened is this fenced-in area will contain this for the larger tots, but for the tiny tots, we've been granted permission to build a double-sided fence going out the other way to safely enclose them to build this for the little nards, for the tiny tots, for the wee ones, the preschoolers and the toddlers, so that the big kids don't trample on the little kids. <coughs> Milo. <coughs> okay? Excuse me. Sorry. This is something that has never been approved before. In fact, it's been declined. This week, it got greenlit. So here's where you come in. On March 17th, we're all going to meet here at 1030. If you have a bulletin, you see it inside, you already know this, one of the surprises. We're going to meet here, and we're going to build this, and we're going to feed you lunch, and we're going to keep the Diet Coke flowing and the bottled water. If you want something else, you got to bring it, and we're going to feed you, and we're going to knock this out as much as we can. Not only are we going to add mulch, we're going to add the new fencing, we're going to add this. If you can't build heavy stuff, maybe you can snap some things together. If you can't do this, can you paint a little bit? Because we're going to do the inside of the children's wing, too. If you notice the beam room, that white thing, you say, oh, man, I spill stuff on the floor. Well, that's good because we're painting the floor. That's where we need help. That white screen in there where the laser shoots down and they have the indoor stuff when it's bad weather, there is a place for you, okay? You're going to hear more about this. You're going to see sign-up sheets in the coming days. There's one other step that we need your help with. All of this has been given to us at a greatly reduced price. God has come through through some connections with church members that have been very gracious. They've matched this discount. And all of this, instead of costing us 15 and 20 grand, we've estimated is going to cost roughly around 4,500 bucks. That's not bad to have something like this. That is, that is a big, we need your help. Here's where you come in. Not your tithes and offerings, not even the vision fund. We're going to do a one-time donation, just a one-time offering from now to the next three weeks until this arrives. Would you pray about giving something towards this? Maybe you're getting an income tax refund and you want to give a donation towards it. Or maybe you are holding back for a, a tangible thing that you could see. Would you consider doing that? If you would, would you just write Vision Children on your memo, on your check? Or if you use the swipe, the electric deposit, you can just type that in. Or put, if you've got cash, just write Vision Playground or Children. Something so we know it will get where it needs to go. This is going to be an investment in the future. Something long overdue and it is going to be so fun. If you were here for that last service day, you know how much fun it was where we come together with a common purpose and we knock some things out. This is a much better first impression for the people. All right, so I've used up all my time. These are exciting days for the potter's hand. I want to say something. It has been an absolute joy to be your pastor. I pray the Lord lets me stay another 50 years here before I retire and we can ride off into the sunset together and it is going to be a, a glorious future. But I want to bring us back to the anchor verse of everything. If I can leave you with one thing, it's verse 37. And he said to them, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the greatest and most important command, church. Oh, and by the way, the second one's just like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Potter's hand. This is why we do what we do. Love God, love people. The future is so bright, you got to wear shades. God is doing awesome things, and I am so excited to witness what he's going to do in the next 15 years. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray for us, and when I dismiss, I'm even going to pray for the food. After I say amen, Priscilla's going to come up and give a few directions, and then we're going to eat, because that's the biblical thing to do next. So if you will bow with me, I would love to pray one more time for you guys. 
Lord, I thank you for this incredible church. I thank you for the absolute honor it is to pastor and shepherd these people under your leadership. Lord, you are so good to us. We take no credit. We give you all glory. We just want to reflect it back to you. I thank you for all you've done. We give you praise and glory. Lord, we thank you for the food that's come. We thank you for the feast that's awaiting us. We are so blessed. We pray that you would just bless that food to our bodies. We thank you for the fellowship that we're about to enjoy. We thank you for all the faces that we see again. Lord, we look forward to the reunion of saints as you welcome Billy Graham into your presence just this week. And as his daughter so faithfully says, just give me Jesus. Lord, may that be our mantra this week. We pray this prayer as we go in Jesus' name. Amen.